The year of 1979, to be honest, was a terrible year for one of the world's largest passenger planes. The Douglas DC-10, even before 1979, suffered multiple hull losses and even for a time held the accolade of being the aircraft involved in the deadliest air disaster to have ever occurred at that time. It's a plane which certainly has a divided history. Its pilots loved the plane. Plenty of people still look back on the aircraft with fondness as an iconic piece of 20th century aviation. On the other hand, it had developed a reputation among passengers and the media due to its string of high-profile incidents. 1979 was, undoubtedly, the plane's worst year. Whether or not this reputation was warranted is up for debate, because as with this case, along with multiple others, there really wasn't anything wrong with the plane itself. Still, Western Airlines Flight 2605 contributed to that long list of accidents on October 31st, 1979. The route between Los Angeles and Mexico City is, as you might expect, a busy one. Numerous flights every single day carry thousands of passengers between the two megacities. In 1979, one of the earliest flights of the day on this busy route was Flight 2605, operated by Western Airlines. The airline affectionately named this particular plane as the Night Owl. On the morning of October 31st, this DC-10 left Los Angeles at 1.40 in the morning. The plane was expected to arrive not long before 6 a.m. local time in Mexico City. Just 75 passengers were scattered about the cabin of the DC-10. Western Airlines had even retrofitted this cabin on this particular plane in a lower density configuration which they labeled as the spaceship to promote passenger comfort. Flying the plane that morning, was 53-year-old Charles Gilbert. He was a highly experienced pilot with over 31,000 flight hours to his name. Though he was still somewhat new to the DC-10 with 248 hours logged on the plane, he was very well acquainted with the Los Angeles to Mexico City route, having landed there a total of 28 times in recent months. His first officer, 46-year-old Ernst Rachel, had a bit more time in the plane. But it is quite interesting that according to the investigation, his total flight hours weren't available, but assumedly, he too had quite extensive experience as a pilot. The third member of the crew was the flight engineer, 39-year-old Daniel Walsh. As the youngest member of the crew, he had 4,000 flight hours behind him, with nearly 400 in the DC-10. Their destination, Mexico City Airport, even at the time, is located within the urban area of the city. Aside from the addition of new terminals, the two runway layout has not changed much since 1979. The two runways, labeled here as 23 left and right, and runway 05 left and right, sit parallel south to the main airport terminal and apron. In 1979, just one of the runways, runway 23 left, was equipped with an instrument landing system, or ILS, the piece of technology that pilots use to let their planes find the runway with the use of radio technology. As you might expect, because of this, this became the more ideal runway to use at the airport. It had become apparent that this runway needed to be resurfaced. Runway 23 left was closed in Mexico City on October 19th, 12 days before the accident. In that time, no planes could take off or land here, and the other parallel runway was used for takeoff and landing. However, this never stopped the airport and pilots from taking advantage of the instrument landing system on 23 left. Though the runway was closed, the instrument approach was not. Pilots would fly toward it for a time before performing what is called a sidestep to runway 23 right. The pilots of Western Airlines Flight 2605 received this very approach from the controllers that morning. The pilots would be handed from one controller to another, on multiple of occasions being notified of the change in runaway. The controllers though would never specify that it was a sidestep approach. It was expected that the pilots would know what to do in this scenario. 
the National Transportation Safety Board would later criticize Mexican air traffic controllers on their lack of using familiar phraseology. This led to some confusion among the flight crew. This was not helped by the fact that visibility was poor that morning. The pilots were only able to see up to three miles ahead of them, enough for the runway to come into view, but at a distance, they weren't able to see the airport at first. The aeronautical information publication for this type of sidestep approach on these particular runaways indicates that pilots should abort the landing attempt if the airport cannot be seen at an altitude of 600 feet. The missed approach procedure calls for the pilots to climb up to an altitude of 8,500 feet and try the landing again. Flight 2605 lined up with runway 23 left as expected. The landing gear was lowered and the flaps extended as the pilots configured their plane for landing like they would have done countless times before. At this time, they could not see the runaway. The DC-10 continued towards the airport, descending down the glide slope to the runaway. Instrument approaches may often appear fascinating to those outside and perhaps unfamiliar with aviation. So to keep everyone up to speed as to how the plane was approaching the airport, even though the pilots couldn't see it, let's have a brief recap. As mentioned, this runway was equipped with something called an ILS, instrument landing system. This worked by having a piece of equipment called a localizer positioned at the runaway broadcast a radio signal. Pilots using their own navigational radios tune into that same frequency. The broadcast is pinged up on the pilot's displays. By inputting the compass heading of the runaway, pilots can be guided laterally to the airport. This technology also works vertically. The localizer can bring an aircraft on a gentle slope towards the foot of the runaway. This is called the glide slope. Because of the current situation at Mexico City at the time, the pilots needed to break off of this approach and maneuver over to the parallel runway, runway 23 right. Sure, it is not ideal, but it's still something that pilots are trained to do. As the DC-10 passed through 600 feet, the runway still had not come into view. The pilots at this point should have abandoned the approach. However, they continued. Now, the case of Western Airlines Flight 2605 is known partly for the short section of the cockpit voice recording that was publicly released. The released recording is only around 20 seconds in length, however, it is unsettling. We'll play this recording in full and uninterrupted, then we'll work backwards and unpack how these 20 seconds unfolded. Take this as your content warning for the cockpit voice recording, as it is considered to be one of the more unsettling recordings to be released. So, let's go back. As indicated on the recording, the captain was aware they were still approaching the left runaway just seconds to touchdown, when by this point, they should have sidestepped. As the runaway was being resurfaced, various pieces of construction equipment were cluttering the runaway. Why wouldn't it? The runaway was closed. Just seconds from disaster, the plane was banked to the right, however the landing gear struck the ground, the plane touching down, off the runaway and on the grass. The pilots attempted to execute an aborted landing. Engine power was increased and the nose of the plane was pitched up. Even with a nose-up angle of 10 degrees, the DC-10 was not able to avoid the truck just ahead of the plane. The truck was occupied at the time. The right side landing gear struck the truck, killing the driver. That underside landing gear separated from the plane and struck the horizontal stabilizer at the back of the aircraft, adding considerable damage to the plane. The DC-10 gained some altitude, but only barely. The damaged plane began banking to the right. Another collision with an excavator would take place, coming in contact with the plane's right side flaps. 
the right wing scraping on the grass and taxiways. That same wing would also clip the corner of a nearby hangar, seconds later as the pilots desperately tried to wrestle the stricken plane back into the air, Flight 2605 crashed into an Eastern Airlines service hangar, completely destroying the aircraft. The disaster killed 73 people, accounting for passengers, crew, and the worker killed in the ground vehicle. 16 occupants had survived. Multiple investigations were launched, not just from the National Transportation Safety Board in the United States. A Mexican investigation was also involved. Following the publication of two separate reports from the two countries, the Airline Pilots Association also carried out their own investigation. It was eventually settled that the pilots had landed on the wrong runway. The crash of Western Airlines 2605 came six months after the disaster of American Airlines 191 that occurred in Chicago. As stated, 1979 was a bad year for the plane. Less than one month later, another DC-10 crashed, this time in Antarctica as Air New Zealand Flight 901. For further information regarding these two accidents, please refer to the videos we've already got on them. As for the aftermath of the Western Airlines accident, because there was no published information pertaining to the approach the pilots should have done, not even in their airport charts, it was recommended that the airport publications be updated to include the sidestep procedure, something that probably should have been there in the first place. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching. If you found this video to be interesting, be sure to be subscribed, as there is always a new video every Saturday. Next week I will be on holiday over the weekend, but there will still be a disaster breakdown video that I will schedule to go out on the Saturday at the usual time. If there's any changes in that, I will let you know on the community tab. Speaking of the community tab, just to get some viewer feedback, how do you like the community tab being used? I've normally used it to tease upcoming videos. If that's the way people like it done, that will continue. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Anyway, of course, it is that time of the week to take a moment to thank my patrons over on Patreon for their incredible ongoing support. Their names are scrolling on the screen right now, so if you see your name here, a massive thanks to you. If you yourself want to support the channel further, then consider joining the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from just £1 per month, and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. All patrons get early access to all new content, 48 hours before it goes out publicly on YouTube. I'll not make this any longer, so I'll end the video here. If you want to follow my personal Twitter page, the link to that will also be in this video's description. Thanks so much for watching, and I will see you all next week. Goodbye!